Good evening and welcome to the December 1st, I'm sorry, December 21st, 2020 regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council. First item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance and Council Member Neil Harris is going to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, next item on our agenda is reflection. And um, as you can see, uh, most of us were, were sort of in festive attire tonight. Um, this, is, this is our last meeting of 2021. And uh, for reflection, I just suggest uh, that everyone take a moment to reflect on um, what we've been through, um, not just the bad, but if there are some good things to reflect on um, and hopefully the good fortune that awaits us in 2021. If we could have a moment of silence, please. Thank you all very much. Next item on our agenda is the approval of minutes. And tonight we have two sets of minutes uh, ready for approval. The first being from the regular session held on November 2nd. What is the pleasure of the council? Mike. I'll uh, move approval of the um, minutes from our regular session Monday, November 2nd. Okay, Lorianne, I saw your hand go up. Second. Okay, I'll call the roll. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. And Council Member Sales. Aye. Thank you all very much. That carries unanimously. And the next set of minutes are from uh, Monday, November 16th. What is the pleasure of the council? Everyone's being deferential here. Okay, yeah. we'll go to Mike. Oh, well, actually, let, let, let's let Lorian make the motion. Mike, you can second. Go ahead, Lorian. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move the approval for the regular session meeting minutes from November 16th, 2020. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. And council member sales. Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Next on our agenda are appointments. And let me just see, uh, we have one appointment this evening um, to the Gaithersburg Parks, Arts and Recreation Corporation. What is the pleasure of the council? Neil Harris. Mr. Mayor, I move the resolution of the City Council confirming an appointment made by you to the Gaithersburg Parts, Parks, Arts and Recreation Corporation for Denise Kayser, term to expire on December of 2023 for a three-year term. Thank you, Ryan. Second. Okay, um, I'll call the roll again. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Sesma. Absolutely aye. Council Member Spiegel. Absolutely aye. Council Member Harris. Just when she thought it was safe to get out, she's we dragged her back in, aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. Thank you very much, Carrie, unanimously. For, for anybody who's watching and is a little confused at the enthusiasm over this appoint, appointment, uh, Denise Kayser is our former uh, division chief for our, our arts and events division in, within Parks, Recreation and Culture for a long time. Um, essentially, she originated the uh, Art and Public Places program in the city of Gaithersburg. She was with us for over 20 years, and we're excited to have her back on board. Only this time, we're not paying her. Um, so bonus. I'm just kidding. Um, we aren't paying her. I'm not kidding about that, but I'm not that happy about it. Okay. But so, now she can tell us what to do without any fear. <laughs> that's true. I bet she's been looking for an opportunity for that. I'm um, sure. So next on our agenda is public comments. And let me look over to the public. And so um, this is the time when the mayor and council would like to hear from anybody who'd like to speak on a topic other than a public 
hearing topic. And we do have one public hearing on 700 North Frederick that's coming up next. But if, you, if you'd like to speak on anything else, tech team, if you could roll the instruction video, please. Good evening. If you've connected to the meeting tonight via Zoom and you're on a desktop or a laptop and you wish to make a public comment, we can't currently see or hear you. What you need to do, please, is wiggle your mouse around and look towards the bottom center of your screen. You should see a raise hand button. Go ahead and click on that now for us, please. Alternatively, if you've connected in via telephone, you can press star nine. Thank you very much, tech team. Um, so this is the time when Mayor and Council love to hear from anybody. I don't at the moment see any hands up. Um, let me just see, going once, going twice. Okay, I do not, I do not see public comments tonight. So we are going to move into our joint public hearing and tech team, if you could bring up everybody, uh, the planning commission and everybody associated with the joint public hearing, we'll get started with that. Tech team, is it helpful if I, you want me to call out the names? Or, okay, here's Caroline. I'll, I'll wait till everybody else is on. Okay. Like a full full group now. Yes. Are we waiting on anybody else? Um, Sharon. Sharon. Okay. There she is. Yep. I think we're probably good to go. Okay. Great. Um, Chris, if we can pull up uh, page thirty-two of the packet. This is a joint public hearing on schematic development plan SDP eight five nine seven twenty twenty. Subject property shown on the monitor is known as 700 North Frederick Avenue. It is a 44 acre site that is generally bounded by Interstate 270 to the Southwest, Montgomery Village Avenue, which is Maryland 124 to the Southeast, North Frederick Avenue, Maryland 355 to the Northeast and a FedEx warehouse located at 800 North Frederick Avenue to the Northwest. Primary access to the site is from North Frederick Avenue. The property is currently improved with approximately 500,000 square feet office complex with associated surface parking, bioretention ponds, a walking trail, and open grass areas, and the property is in the MXD, Mixed Use Development Zone. The applicant is requesting to construct 460,600 square feet of commercial development in two 225,000 square foot flex buildings, plus a restaurant and retail service station associated surface parking, the continuation of the planned linear park along North Frederick Avenue, and an infrastructure plan to accommodate future development in accordance with the sketch plan. The joint public hearing was duly advertised on December 3rd and December 10th, 2020 in the Washington Post, and has also been posted on the city's website since December 1st. Property was also properly posted with public hearing signs on December 2nd, 2020. At the present time, there are 66 exhibits in the record files. They are referenced in an exhibit list in the files. The individual exhibits may be reviewed during the course of the meeting or in the Planning and Code Administration Office during regular business hours at City Hall or on the city's website. Any objections to the receipt of any exhibit should be noted prior to the closing of the record. Otherwise, they will be deemed received in evidence. Um, we can go back to slide number 29 now, please. And I would like to introduce the applicant, Mark Matten is here from the Matten Companies, uh, and he will start us off. If he's here, is Mark here? Good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mark. Good evening. 
Yeah, good evening. Happy holidays. I missed the memo, but nice work, G Berg team. Really, uh, thank fun. you. I'm not sure Neil Harris's memo, but great, awesome, fun. Um, so back in front of you, I am uh, the same passionate kid from Gaithersburg, but I'm back with a different twist on the plan. We uh, listened to what you said and have spent the last few months with staff. Thank you, back and forth with Tom. Thanks to you and your office and trying to address some of the comments from before. Um, you know, COVID, hopefully everyone's safe and tonight's review is not about COVID. So, but COVID, what it's done for Gaithersburg has presented some different opportunities. And the good news is it's presented some opportunities being strategically located between NIH and Fort Detrick really has put Gaithersburg on the map and you've already signed some leases that are of national recognition. And that's not the only industry out there, but it is certainly one that is in the need of space and creating a lot of jobs. So um, what you're gonna see in front of you today is not only mixed use, but it's also, it's a flexible product, product that can address multiple users out there. But specifically, we certainly have our eye on the bio side. Um, and we have done this before. These buildings exist and they are proven winners. And Brian will walk you through um, what I'm hoping. Um, and I think probably from previous dealings with other tenants is speed to market is front and center today. And that's more, it is a COVID thing, but also a lot of the bio industry, by the time they've made the decision, they want the buildings tomorrow. So my commitment to Gaithersburg, I'm not here to rush you, that's not it. But my commitment is I would like to build these buildings without having a tenant. I do not have a tenant today. So I will build both buildings, the world doesn't change, that's my goal. And really I'd like that investment to start right after the first of the year by demoing what is there today. And that is not something we do pre-approval typically, but I think it will generate additional interest and make this project feel more real. So we're excited. I'm looking forward to investing in Gaithersburg. Again, thank you staff, thank you, Tom. And I will turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Mark. And uh, I just wanna echo what Mark said, just you know, working with staff, it's been a great process so far and we've worked very closely. And I think we've, um, as you'll see tonight, we've provided a really good product. So. Uh, and the project's going to be great. So I just, I wanted to thank staff. So um, actually, if you could skip or go to the next slide, please. So this is the, the team. So, um, you know, with the Matten companies, you have Mark Matten, Carl Morris, and myself. Um, and Vika is the civil engineer, Miles and Stockbridge, land use attorney, and then uh, our architect, uh, Powers Brown Architect. So next slide, please. Uh, so we want to include the mission statement. Um, I, I won't read it, but just the last sentence, I think really just kind of highlights exactly what Mark said and what we're trying to provide for this property is really it's the vision will result in a diverse job growth and services for the city of Gaithersburg that will ultimately enhance the quality of life for its residents. So I think that's something that this project that um, you'll see, it really just kind of carries through in its plan. So next slide, please. So again, just a location overview. Uh, so the property is located at the intersection of North Frederick Avenue, Montgomery Village Avenue, and uh, the I-270, um, and the newly constructed um, Watkins Mill Interchange. So really just given the, the property's location and its significant uh, potential to strengthen its position as an employment hub in the area, um, it really creates a horizontal mix of uses, we think, with the existing housing that's to the north, the east, and the west as well as the existing retail that's there. And it really just it strengthens the diversity of the commercial um, development that's along this corridor. And, and it's a well-established corridor. So it, it, this project will create new opportunities for that as well. So um, just 
as far as consistency, the master plan for this property does recommend the property um, um, to be the commercial uh, and industrial research and office is what the designation gave it. It was the 1997 master plan um, when they reason and also when they resigned the property from uh, I-3 to the uh, current zoning of MXD, uh, which was later then uh, reconfirmed in 2001 with the corridor plan. Um, so our proposal tonight, I think you'll, you'll notice that it's very consistent with both the master plan and the corridor plan. Next slide, please. So just uh, some brief history of the sketch plan. So as you know, the, it was approved in August of 2019, uh, which allowed for the redevelopment of the property for up to 650,000 square feet of commercial density, uh, which again is in line with the master plan recommendations. Uh, as we go through the SDP tonight, uh, you will notice that the plan does meet the requirements of each block outlined here uh, and substantially meets uh, the, pro pro the proposed phasing uh, for the sketch plan where the majority of the development um, in phase one um, will occur within block A with a portion of it um, in block B as well. Uh, and it also adheres to the open space requirements of the continuation of the linear park uh, the employee amenity areas, and then the naturalized space along Montgomery Village and um, I-270. Next slide, please. So the uh, proposed SDP before you tonight, again, it's, it's what we've, we're introducing that you see here is phase one, which consists of roughly 39 acres of the entire 44 acres site. Um, and includes um, over 460,000 square feet of commercial employment and retail uses, uh, again, with the attractive open spaces and amen amenity areas on the site. You'll notice that parcel H and J are not part of this application. Uh, it will be considered phase two, um, but we are confident just since we've gone through this process that you know, SDP applications for those two parcels, we think will follow here shortly. So um, they won't be um, won't be too long. Uh, next slide, please. So just kind of going into each individual lot, starting with lot one on the, the northernmost lot. This is a proposed retail and fueling station of up to 5,600 square feet, a proposed building height of 26 feet, and it provides 81 parking spaces. Uh, so you'll notice that lot one is integrated very well with the linear park with inviting pedestrian connections from North Frederick Avenue. Um, and it's Lot one is also very well served with the vehicular um, circulation that we'll talk a little bit later, but parcel A is uh, a proposed right in, right out. And then parcel D that you see on the right is the existing um, full movement intersection that's there. So as far as ve vehicular circulation and access to um, this lot itself, it, it functions very well. Next slide, please. The so lot four, which is on the corner of North Frederick Avenue and Montgomery Village Avenue, is a uh, proposed to be a restaurant retail building of up to 5,000 square feet and the proposed building height of 26 feet. So lot 52 provides, um, or lot four, I'm sorry, provides 52 parking spaces uh, and two outdoor uh, seating areas to accommodate really the new norm and with um, you know, indoor and outdoor dining. Um, and food pickup. Um, this lot also, as you can tell, does have a drive-through, which does follow the city's guidelines of the best practices um, of drive-through lanes, which allows for uh, appropriate car stacking, the access points, and then also making sure that's pedestrian friendly. Next slide, please. So lot five and six are the flex buildings, which is will be the majority, obviously, of, of the development of this property. Um, so, as was mentioned, it's uh, two flex buildings, each 225,000 square feet for a total of 450,000 square feet uh, between the two buildings. And each building is a proposed height of 50 feet. So again, as Mark mentioned, uh, you know, given the speculative nature of this development, uh, the proposed uses listed on the permitted uses chart um, includes, but it's not limited to the light manufacturing, laboratories, wholesale businesses, and, and offices, just to name a few. Um, and also with the speculative um, nature of this development, um, assigning a specific parking ratio um, from the city ordinance 
really was kind of difficult at this stage as it was brought out in the in the staff report. Um, but we did we worked very closely with staff to come up with uh, an appropriate parking ratio uh, for this development. Uh, again, which it really accommodates the flexibility of a variety of future tenants and uses uh, for these buildings. So, um, and as we went through this, there was also a, a letter that was submitted to you as well that was, um, supported this parking ratio. Because with other developments that we've done in the past, um, you know, especially on a speculative build, um, you know, you don't want to supply too much parking, but then also you don't want to not have enough parking. So the nice thing about this is in between uh, these buildings in the loading area, uh, you are able to accommodate um, additional parking here, which again, the nice thing is it does not increase any impervious area. Um, and so the final number of this um, can be established at the, at the final site plan or even an amendment to the final site plan. But the flexibility of these buildings really does uh, cater to uh, a speculative build and future tenancy. So whether tenants come or go, um, we're able to accommodate them. Next slide, please. So here's an illustrative rendering of um, the buildings on lots five and six. Uh, so we feel that nice looking buildings really is a key to a successful project. Um, so we're demonst demonstrating that here with, with this uh, rendering, uh, which also carries over to the design guidelines that was submitted to you as well. So all the buildings within the development on lots five and six and also the retail uh, and commercial lots uh, will have um, a lot of articulation, uh, minimum of 30% glazing at the, at the tenant entrances, um, water tables, and really just high quality uh, materials for each of these buildings. Next slide, please. As far as the site circulation, so really in accordance with the approved sketch plan, the main point of access is that center light that you see there on the plan, which is a, an existing full movement intersection. Um, along North Frederick Avenue. Um, we've also introduced a proposed right in right out and we've worked very closely with State Highway uh, and, and we're at preliminary approvals with them, but we're just continuing that process uh, with them as well. Um, as far as interior ve vehicular circulation, um, you'll notice that there is a commercial service road that is interior to the site that runs parallel to 355. So this road really helps separate the retail uses from the flex buildings, but also does a great job of the distribution of traffic between the various slots. Um, so it's, as far as the circulation and being interior to the site, it really distributes um, the vehicles very nice. Uh, we also have four pedestrian access points uh, from North Frederick Avenue through the linear park that access each individual lot. So all pedestrian movements are safe with sidewalks and crosswalks. Um, and since we see re the retail here really acts as an additional amenity for the flex buildings, um, creating safe pedestrian movements between all the lots, we thought was very important and wanted to make sure that we incorporate it. Next slide, please. So the open space and outdoor amenities. So as mentioned, uh, we have the linear park uh, that runs along uh, North Frederick Avenue in the front of the site. Uh, we also have two employee amenity areas on either side of the site. Um, and then the naturalized area um, that abuts I-270 and Montgomery Village Avenue. So all in all, um, we're essentially providing 50% more of the green area that, that's required. Um, so the requirement's 25%, um, we're providing 43% of the green area. So with the naturalized area there along 270, uh, this area will really greatly be enhanced by removing the existing path that's currently there today. And we'll be providing additional tree plantings uh, to allow this area really to be preserved as a conservation area. Uh, so with the existing stream bed that's there, this area will be protected and enhanced with the redevelopment of the site. Uh, we're also submitted a variance for the remo removal of nine specimen trees that are located throughout the site that fall within the limits of disturbance. And then we also have a, a variance for um, some permanent and temporary impacts to the stream valley buffer and floodplain, uh, which essentially it, they're, overall they're less than a tenth of an acre. Um, but again, with the removal of the path, we're really enhancing this area, protecting it and adding additional plantings, and it really enhances that stream and that area as well. 
Next slide, please. So just want to give you some perspectives of what we're providing as far as the naturalized space and open space. So again, consistent with the um, corridor plan, we're providing the linear park along the frontage. Uh, this park will include a uh, eight foot shared use path with multiple links from the public realm to the property's retail and commercial buildings. Um, and as you'll notice, it also has attractive manicured landscaping with pockets of seating areas, as you'll see in uh, view number one. So with the linear park, we're really committed to the quality of the park while, rather than the call it quantity of the park or size of the park. Um, and the reason for this is the redevelopment of the property really allows, this allows for the economic success of new commercial and retail buildings um, that are able to sit closer to the public uh, right away, you know, uh, North Frederick Avenue, 355, um, and also promotes and creates a, more of an urban form um, for, for the development as well. So really given the mixed use nature of this project versus say next door with the FedEx facility, uh, who is a single user uh, and a single tenant that really kind of wants to be secluded. So having that buffer with the, a larger natural park there, uh, it is a gated facility. Um, you know, we really want to, um, again, just enhance this with a, showing the viability of um, more of an inviting um, area along uh, the linear park to really, again, just kind of enhance the success of the project. You also notice the two amenity, um, employee amenity areas there. Um, so these areas are really defined with different garden rooms for seating, lawn space, pocket parks for relaxation and outdoor meeting and dining areas. So they're large enough to accommodate different activities or recreation, um, um, recreation that maybe companies may want to provide for their employees as well. So um, it's, I think we've done a nice job of just kind of enhancing that. And then also with the public art there on the corner, um, again, really just activating the space and um, creating, again, like it says there, a gateway um, along this corridor and then into the development. Next slide, please. So with that, um, again, just kind of ending on the mission statement, but you know, we appreciate your time this evening. And again, we appreciate working with staff. And um, so if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you all very much for the, for the presentation. Um, Brian, I do, I do have a couple of questions and then I'll, then I'll turn it over to any other council members or planning commissioners who wanna ask questions and then we'll go to anybody from the public who wants to speak. Um, so first about the, the traffic flow, um, the, so there's the one, there's the one right in, right out, and then there's the other, uh, entrance exit. And if I, uh, am reading your slide, right. And the plan, right. There's a traffic light there. So somebody coming out of the project would be able to make a left on northbound 355. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. And that's how it functions today as well. Okay. Um, okay, and then the, the, the only other question I have uh, really is about the architecture and design guidelines. Um, you know, I, I sort of understand where you guys are and you're building, a, you're, you're building these two buildings on spec and you don't know who the tenants are gonna be and what sort of needs or, or uh, stylistic characteristics that they might that your tenants might want, um, you know, I, I get it. I want to break it up too. I, I, I want to, I want to see something out of the ordinary too. And, and I see that you guys have done it. I'm not in love with the rendering that, that we've got there. Um, so I, I just want to put that out there and, and should this pro this, this, um, ultimately go forward. I want to put it, just plant that seed in, in the planning commissioner's ears. Uh, you know, our planning commission is, has, with working with applicants on other projects has, has yielded some just terrific looking projects, interesting, uh, be, better designed uh, than, than they would normally have. And I'm not saying that you guys, you guys do great work. I'm not, I'm not, this is not a reflection on you. Just don't, I'm just not in love with that, with the rendering. Like, um, so, so I've put that out there. Let me, 
let me end there and give council members and planning commissioners a chance to ask questions or comments before we go to anybody from the public. Just raise your hand if you want to uh, get a word in here. John Bauer. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, let me ask the applicants team just a kind of a, the planning strategy, a little bit more about the planning strategy. You've left parcel H and parcel J for the future, which sort of leaves some teeth knocked out of the comb along um, along 355. So what what is the logic for that? Why not develop fully, um, say, the corner closest to the to the intersection all the way up to your um, your main access drive, and then leave the the northernmost maybe for future? What's What's the logic behind leaving it sort of interspersed like that? Yeah, so it's um, a lot of it's tenant driven. Um, I'm just how you know the negotiations and talks with tenants, um, but it's I think it's something that you know we're really we're looking for retail users at this point. Um, and like I said, I, I don't see that these uh, these empty parcels will stay vacant too long. Um, it's just with the information that we had now um, and trying to advance um, the development, um, this is what was provided um, for this application tonight. Well, I, I think the reason it, it just raises concern is that an STP is usually a more comprehensive and more cohesive sort of approach. So um, leaving big chunks out of it is a little bit counter um, counterproductive, at least in an STP kind of process where, where you're looking for a little bit more continuity between the buildings, between the circulation, all, all of the features of the site, you know, all of the things you're going to develop. So it just raises a concern that that why not at an STP level go ahead and create a full-blown picture of what this looks like and how it really is knitted together um, as opposed to leaving just a blank spot. But we can we can get into that more in discussion. Um, the other question I'm going to ask real quick, um, in, in developing um, any of these buildings, and, and um, the mayor was kind of getting after it, is there something inherently I mean, I know there's inherently a different construction type for the larger flex buildings, but is there anything inherently different about why they would need to look different than the retail buildings along the Frederick Avenue um, frontage, or could all of those have a bit more continuity in, in, in the materials and the architecture and the look and the feel, some of the, some of the elements of the design itself? Yeah, I don't know, Chelsea, if you want to Sure, so um, on a speculative basis, we went with a color scheme that was branded to the owner. Certainly once a tenant comes in, if there was um, obviously specific signage that wanted that, that a tenant wanted to implement, then there is space on the facade for that. Additionally, if it was acceptable to the owner as well as the local jurisdiction, then does it, the color scheme doesn't necessarily have to stay um, as we indicated on the render. So if we get a, a single user that is of a certain marketing palette, then that's certainly a discussion that we can do. Mm -hmm. um, and once we know some of that information, I mean, it is paint. It, it, paint is easy to change, um, especially as tenants start to come in and we start to understand how to make it cohesive. There's definitely steps like that that we can do um, to make it all match. And I think the design guidelines are kind of the regulating tool for that too. Yep. Make sure that everything is cohesive. Um, and so we've tried to incorporate that into the design guidelines and to create the cohesiveness yep. throughout all the buildings. I think Mark Matten wants to get a word in here. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, Brian, if you could switch it over. Yep, go ahead. Just real quick, um, Mr. Mayor, I think, first of all, on the renderings, we're pushing this, I'm pushing the envelope to be ahead of you. So some of my renderings and things, when I get to the Planning Commission, you'll see it. But what everyone has to understand, under no circumstances, none, does speculative mean less good. If I'm going spec, it's gotta be extra good. So I want the same wow factor you want. Um, John, your comment is interesting. So the reality, I had five retail users pre-COVID. Now, oops, did it switch over? No, you're still good. Oh, okay. you're still on. Now, now kind of hopefully towards the end of COVID, we had three users. 
I would actually like to build at least one, if not two retail buildings of our own. Those we would tie to the architectural type in the back. Um, but what we are trying to do is, is also mirror getting this thing to market, but also not stamping a plan on a lot that I have to come back to you guys and rechange. So there was, so we decided to leave it a green space for now. Um, but I, I hear you, I think it's something we can address moving forward, matching some individual national retail users to the flex buildings may be difficult, but I think we also can do it in consistent signage and things like that. The other thing I'd like you to know, the example of this product I have in a lot of places and it's evolved over time and it's gotten really nice. Small things I do that other developers don't do. Every inch of green space, every inch of planted area that's adjacent or close to this building, I will fully sprinkle. Um, this is this is to look like Augusta. It is not to look like something else. And I am adamant about it. So again, I just, I wanted to chime in. I, the word speculative, it's, today it's being thrown around from our perspective as it's a good thing. I want to push the investment in Gaithersburg. But again, it is not to cut any corners. It's not to stamp something that people don't want. I really believe if I'm going to attract high quality tenants, it's got to be first class stuff. So give me a shot. Once I get a, a nod or a, something from the planning commission, I will spend real, real money on tweaking these renderings. But because you've said that, Judd, that you might have a rendering Monday morning that looks better. So um, I hear you. So. Hey, John, this is Carl. I wanted to follow up on uh, parcel, parcel H. Uh, the other factor that's playing into that is that we're working with our good neighbor next door to get full movement access at that intersection. And unfortunately, as Mark and Brian had indicated, it's speed to market. We wanna get this thing approved as quickly as possible. And that's still an unknown for us. So that's why we carved that out. So we're, we're hoping that we can get that full movement uh, intersection that would just change the dynamics uh, parcel H totally. Thank you, Carl. John Bauer, were you finished? I'm good, thank you. Okay, we'll go to Mike Sesma. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Judd, and, and thank you for the presentation um, and uh, the explanation on, on uh, why you've presented the renderings you have tonight. Uh, but, and I, and I think I wanna follow up with what uh, the mayor said. <clears throat> I think, uh, if the public sees these uh, these renderings, they're going to say these really look like warehouses and distribution centers. And I know that is a, a you know a potential use for some of the property, but uh, so I think as soon as you can show some renderings that suggest that it's more than than something like that, then uh, the flex then I think uh, the idea that these are flex buildings will be a reality to people who will look at it. So. Um, I had some similar reactions to, to what was shown here. Uh, basically, uh, very little glass, uh, no adornments, but you know, I understand what you're, you know, what you want to achieve tonight. But I did have that one question, and that was particularly if you look on uh, slide nine, I think, uh, that lists the uh, permitted uses. I was just wondering what. A percentage of square footage might be committed to, or uh, again, this is for spec anyway, uh, distribution and warehouse uh, uses. Uh, how much of that do you expect here? Can you guys say, Mark? Okay. I, I think at this point, it's hard to say. We do not have a tenant in hand. Mm -hmm. So, but what, so I'm not talking around that, that's certainly a permitted use. But also those uses come in different forms. Like let's talk about the biotech industry for a second. That supply chain is broad. I mean, right now we have, for instance, the vaccines being distributed by Thermo Fisher and a few local tenants. So that's different than maybe same day type distribution. But I, right now in these buildings, we can do a mezzanine. 
That mezzanine can be mechanical for biotech. That mezzanine can be full blown office. Um, so real motivational from a landlord's perspective, the highest and best use probably pays the most. So therefore I'm pushing for that. All right. Um, if that answers your question. But again, some of this stuff is so preliminary and given the history, I didn't want to slam it too much down anyone's throat. So again, we have some block plans here, but I also have, I mean, Tom's taken the tour. I've had, I have examples of what I've done before and I do have to appeal to PhDs and doctors and, and that's from amenity spaces to glass to everything else. So I, I, again, I hear you loud and clear and I will make sure that's addressed before you guys see another. another okay, question. and so uh, I, I'll just have, I have one more question. Given the, the, uh, the size or the expanse of the, uh, the spaces over these two buildings, are, do you have any, and the entire property, do you have any uh, intent to, uh, to use, uh, to, to either explore green roofs or solar roofs or other uh, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, yes. activities on the on the property uh is that has that been a practice that you've uh, adopted in your other properties yeah so we've gone to a whole new electric car charging station setup which will be implemented here um not only is it practical it's got it's cool looking i like it we've done it with solar panels um the solar panels themselves above the car parking doesn't doesn't provide it complete amount of power, but it contributes. The green roofs, no on this side, but solar roofs, we are very close as an industry, very close. So we are doing, because we have to prepare these roofs for the mezzanine, that gives us the load to be ready for that. And um, we have certain examples, that, again, it's evolving over time, but these are a perfect candidate for it. So, um, but again, you don't see that wholesale across the market right now. They're coming up with some lighter panels, but um, I'd say as soon as that's adopted, this would be one of the first spots we put it in. Again, we're prepping that roof and that joist for something of significant weight. So. Yeah, so I think, you know, there's certainly R&D uh, clients or tenants that are interested in uh, sustainable practices in the buildings that they move into. So I think those are- 100%. Things that could- could help. So, you know, from this, you know, this PhD's perspective, it sounds like a pretty good plan. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We'll go to Rob Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And, and thank you for the presentation. Um, kind of just leaving or starting where Mike just left off is, you know, my impression in, in looking at least the renderings was kind of akin to what Mike got out of it, which is, a whole lot of concrete, not a lot of glass. And so um, my, my question was going to be is, you know, the, the, the sketch provides for up to six stories. Um, it wasn't clear to me what you guys conceptually were looking at. Is it one story with a whole lot of headspace, but, or is the mezzanine like a second floor um, it, it, inside the building? So you have the entry floor and then a mezzanine above. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. these. Um... They're built as a, a shell to begin with, but the mezzanine capability, given the location, the price of rents, I would be shocked if the mezzanine wasn't utilized by the tenants. And I would say the mezzanine here will come in two forms. It'll either be office or for the labs, it would be a mechanical mezzanine. One you can walk on, but it would be holding mechanical equipment. So. Okay, so, so is it, is it, the, the mezzanine will overlook a, a concrete wall or is there the possibility of glass on the facade? No, we'll have glass on the facade. We can cut in glass panels. Um, the rears of these buildings can, in very short order, be all glass. You can rotate glass in loading. We can rotate drive in loading with glass. They're, that's, that's the kind of beauty, that is the beauty of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rob, Mike, this is Carl. This, this is, it's tilt-up concrete, which we've done, right. you know, millions of square feet. And as Mark said, this is, this is being built on a speculative basis. An example I would use is 
we leased one of these buildings, 126,000 square feet to a lab user. The lab uses don't want windows within the lab, but what they do want is a corridor along the exterior wall that allows their employees to come out of the lab and at least walk down a corridor with sunlight. So what we've done in virtually 50% of our buildings, because it is tilt up, we can cut in a glass or and drop in a, a, a glass. So it's a it's a very versatile building and it's a fine line between doing this on spec and putting in the right amount of window line and versus concrete walls. So it, it, I, we hear what you're saying and we can certainly work on that, but you gotta give us the flexibility to get a tenant, understand what their needs are and then adapt the building to meet those needs. Okay, understood and thank you. Um, other question I had was it, it it's not quite clear from the schematic development plan and it kind of looked like from the rendering that the northern side of Montgomery Village Avenue did not have pedestrian um, a, a sidewalk. Right now there is a sidewalk but it kind of looked like from the rendering that that was being uh, taken out of what is being proposed here. Is that, am I correct there or there's still going to be a... Uh, there would still be a sidewalk there. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. it doesn't show well on that since it's technically offsite. Um, but there, there still is a sidewalk there on Montgomery Village Avenue. Yeah, okay. if you, Robert. If you go to the um, overall package, Exhibit Forty Five, and look at page one eighty three, that gives you a better depiction as as to what this graphic's trying to depict. Okay, and, and so uh, I'm probably not going to be able to flip through on my phone to, to find that page right now. I'll just add the comment that, you know, on the, the north-south on that side on 355 is, is, a, is a wide and um, pretty good uh, mixed-use path. Um, currently, the north side of Montgomery Village Avenue as it leads over to uh, 270, I think, is a three-foot concrete. So to the extent that you can... Um, widen it, make it more of a mixed use path, that would be um, beneficial it, if it's on site. I'm not sure. I think you just, anyway, as we're developing the property, that might be something to think about. That's, I'm looking at it now that it looks like that sidewalk is off site. But there, there is a, a sidewalk that goes along North Frederick Avenue. Look at page 183. It's, it's, so. I've got my packet on my iPhone. It's kind of <laughs> good <difficult>. luck. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, if you, if the you idea are, out to whoever owns that property uh, that if we're developing the site, it might be a good opportunity to enhance the mixed use um, uh, path along uh, Montgomery Village Avenue on that north side. Okay. I think if you show slide eight in your presentation, that actually shows the the boundaries of the property, and then the the uh, the sidewalk and curb outside that property along the north side of 124. Can you go to slide eight, or that was page 36, I think, or 38, 36, 36. Excuse me, um, if you could make yeah, sure right there, right there, that's order the packet page number. That would help staff. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. So I think you can, I, I think this answers your question, Rob, about the sidewalk on uh, the north side of yeah. 124. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry. Thank you. That was my, my question. Thanks, Rob. Um, I cannot, okay. Anybody else have questions, just raise your hand. Going once, going twice, okay. Well then, this is the time the Mayor and Council and Planning Commission would like to hear from anybody in the public who'd like to speak on this plan. Um, the tech team rolled the video before about how to raise your hand on Zoom if you'd like to speak and we'll call on you. We ask that you state your name and address or neighborhood for the record 
keep your comments to no more than three minutes. Anybody who has more than three minutes worth of comments can submit them to us in writing and they'll be, they'll be considered just like oral comments. Um, and I see we have uh, one hand up here, tech team, if you could bring up David Belgard. And um, David, when, when you come up, just unmute yourself, state your name and address or neighborhood and go right ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Mary Ash. My name is David Belgard. I live in Washington Woods. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that, that uh, I really appreciate all the hard work that has clearly gone into this, uh, especially from the changeover from the original plan. Uh, I, I love all the green space, how the, the idea of the loading docks being camouflaged, the green uh, uh, areas for the workers to hang out in. Uh, I do share a lot of concern that I heard the mayor and various council members voice about the look and feel of the rendering. And after hearing some of the architects talk about it, I understand this building is uh, seems to be kind of modular and it can be changed on the fly and, and, and fixed up to, 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 to meet anyone's needs, uh, which is very cool, by the way. What I will say, though, is I am still a bit concerned, though, because what I haven't heard is that it's definitely going to have a look and feel that fits in with Gettysburg. Right now, it's a, it looks a little bit brutalist. Um, you know, it's, it's just big concrete boxes, and that may not be how it ends up. But until there's tenants and the architects have a feel for what they want, we don't really know what we're going to get, uh, even in kind of grand scope. The other thing that I'd like to bring up, bring up um, Councilmember Wu mentioned that the sketch plan overview indicates block A and block B max height is six stories. And the renderings clearly don't appear to match that. In fact, they appear to uh, represent about three stories worth of space. Um, especially considering the limited uh, build out space that we have in the city. It's, uh, I think it's important to use all of our space wisely into its maximum effect. Uh, so I would be very hopeful that the space would be built up somewhat more than the sketches indicate. And in fact, if they were, inclusion of offices, even if they're large open uh, floor plans that scientists and researchers may want, um, may create those kind of windows that we need to see to know that's going to fit in with our look and feel. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Are there any other speakers this evening? I see a few more members of the public, but at the moment I don't see. Okay, Debbie Sarabia. Um, tech team, if you can bring up Debbie. And Debbie, when you come up, just unmute yourself, state your name and address or neighborhood and go right ahead. Uh, hello, good evening. Um, uh, wish you all happy holidays, happy solstice. My name is Debbie Sarabia. I live in so um, Saybrook neighborhood. It's approximately three miles from the proposed development. I'm the, the president of Seneca Creek Watershed Partners. We are a local nonprofit of volunteers. We help to protect and restore our streams, wetlands, and greenways. And we have the following comments. The project is in the middle Great Seneca watershed. Our city's portion of the watershed is severely degraded. Uh, the proposed development does not adequately protect the watershed. Specifically, the applicant submitted six pages of requests for environmental waivers. Impacts include permanent incursion into the stream buffer, the removal of nine increasingly rare mature canopy specimen trees, and an 8.6 acre increase of pavement. Now the applicant stated, if I interpret it correctly, that due to the increased um, pavement, they cannot maintain all the stormwater on site and that 50% of the site's runoff will be uh, delivered to the creek, which is a tributary of the Great Seneca Creek. Now the applicant also stated that, quote, not granting the waiver would provide unnecessary hardship for the applicant by further reducing the developable, developable area of the site, end quote. Um, I disagree. I don't believe the city's environmental requirements are too strict. I think an innovative developer can meet those requirements that it has been done before. 
Uh, the city are asking you to reject further insults to our watershed, refuse any increase of impervious pavement and deny the environmental waiver requests. Give us a development that we are gonna be proud of and that will protect our environment. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your testimony, Debbie. Do we have any other members of the public who'd like to speak? Just raise your hand on Zoom. Going once, going twice, okay. Um, that will conclude the public comments. Um, I want to give uh, the Matt and team, if, if you had any, uh, if you'd like to respond to anything that's been said uh, from the public or that you hadn't responded to from council members, give you guys a chance. I think, um, again, this is a work in progress. Um, we will work on refining the renderings and enhancing the field. I know it's an important location and it's important to us. And whether it's, again, the amenity package, the artwork, um, the green space, I will make sure in our next presentation that um, you, it just gives you a little better feel for what it is. Um, and I will close with the fact that we are excited about this. Um, I do believe there's demand out there. There's good demand out there. And again, forget the word speculative. I don't even like it after this meeting, but I, I want to be ready for them. You guys just went through a great tenant landing, and I know a lot of it had to do around speed. And I just want to be ready. I want to cut off that 18 month period, that the period where we lose the person. And that's all I'm getting at here. Um, again, it is not at all going to compromise quality, period. So I really appreciate it. Um, again, thanks staff and um, happy holidays, everybody. I'm bummed about the sweater, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Um, so I, I just wanna put things in perspective here. I don't, I, I don't think, I mean, I I'm, hope I'm not going too far off on a limb here to say that council members and I are not put off by the idea of, of building buildings on spec as you mentioned, um, 700 Quince Orchard was entirely refurbished on spec um, and look what happened. That's where Novavax is gonna build their campus. Uh, we, and I'm, again, I don't think we're, I'm going too far off on a limb to say, we're also bullish on the prospects here. We think, we think that there's tremendous prospects for this property and for what you guys wanna do with it. I. Um, in general, I, I, I like the ideas here. I like where we're going. I think we can further refine uh, where we are design-wise. Uh, you, you know, we'll have to take a look at the environmental uh, questions that the that our, our uh, member of the public brought up. Um, but um, we look forward to the, the further refinement of this plan and taking through the process. Anybody else have any uh, final comments on this? Mr. Mayor, I'll mention one quick thing. I know, um, I know you, you you sort of alluded to this. That to whatever extent the renderings have suggested a certain type or a certain way of designing the buildings, um, what's important to emphasize for the public is that none of that is really vested or finished until we get through a final site plan stage. Um, this is all very conceptual for the purposes of understanding scale and, and a little bit about what the sizes are. But I think it's it's a, it's it's really not appropriate to assume right now that these are going to look anything like these renderings until um, quite a bit more work is done. And I think um, very specifically the comments that you and other and the, the council members made about it um, is really taken in and, and thought thought more thoroughly uh, about and, and rendered and discussed and developed. Um, I mean, I think that the important thing to, to, to focus on is that whatever comments are made are consistent with the density that's proposed and the types of uses that are proposed. And it sounds like we're in a pretty good spot for that right now. Thank you, John, we'll uh, go to Phil. Yeah, thanks Mr. Mary, and, and I'll keep it very brief. I, and I was gonna say <laughs> something very close to what John just mentioned about, you know, we can have a, and we'll have a very uh, thorough and detailed discussion of architecture and, and the elevations and materials when we get down the line. Um, and so I'll, I'll uh, 
mercifully park all my thoughts and comments on that till a future hearing. Um, I think a, a critical thing, you know, when we get speaking as a member of the planning commission, that I think it would be good to have a much more detailed discussion of uh, when when you come before us are the environmental waivers, uh, specifically the stormwater. Um, I know someone raised raised green roofs um, and and other items there. Obviously, there are there are cost trade offs and engineering trade offs, but looking at the size of your roofs and and having you know run these numbers a couple times. Um, it, it would be good to, to have your civil engineer run the numbers and tell you exactly how much of your stormwater you could treat re and retain and keep out of the streams if you put green roofs on these buildings. Um, and I think I just would recommend we come prepared for a, a detailed discussion of, of those sorts of, of nuances uh, when we come before the Planning Commission. All right. Thank you, Phil. I, I am not seeing any other hands going up at the moment. So um, let's see. Uh, planning Commission, I'll let you guys do your recommendations. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as, as you've seen in the staff report, staff is recommending that we hope on, uh, keep our record open until 5 p.m. on January 27th, 2021, um, with a recommendation scheduled for February 3rd, 2021. Is there a motion from the Commission, please. So moved. Okay. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Commissioner Wessel. Aye. Commissioner Kaufman. Aye. Commissioner Hopkins. Aye. And participating tonight uh, is uh, Alternate Commissioner Ken Trell. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Our recommendation is that we hold a record open until 5 p.m. on February 12th, 2021. Uh, with anticipated policy discussion and final action on March 15th, 2021. What is the pleasure of the council? Mike? So moved. Rob? Second. Okay, I'll call the roll. Every, all in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Sesma? Aye. Council Member Spiegel? Aye. Council Member Harris? Council Member Harris? Aye. Council Member Wu? Aye. And Council Member Sales? Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Uh, happy holidays to everyone. Happy New Year. Um, we will see you all soon. And the next uh, item on our agenda is from the mayor and city council. I'll wave to everybody. Um, and I will, uh, we're going to start tonight with Council Member Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, I'd like to just echo what I thought Mark Matten had said, is that your sweater is very unfortunate. It might have been what he said, I'm not sure. About mine? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, he heckled Neil a little bit. That wasn't me. Neil looks perfect. Um, so I don't have much to say tonight other than um, everybody have a happy holiday, have a safe holiday, um, have a great new year, um, and we'll, we'll see you in 2021. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm going to Mike next because he always, over the years, every year he brings up the solstice. Tonight we have a meeting on the solstice. Let's go Mike Sesma. Well, happy solstice. It's a significant uh, um, longstanding, uh, celebration in, for humankind in many cultures. Uh, and in fact, probably our Christmas holiday is somewhat derived from the celebration of the solstice. Um, today was the solstice. It was actually at about five o'clock this morning. That meant we had the shortest period of daylight in the year today. Tomorrow, uh, the period of daylight will increase by about three minutes and three minutes each day uh, again, three minutes each day after that. So um, unfortunately, the cloud cover prevented us from seeing the great conjunction of, uh, of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, but apparently tomorrow night, it's supposed to be clear skies. So we will be able to see those two planets uh, closely opposed, but uh, not as close as tonight when they probably look like one star. So I want to echo the uh, 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 the wishes for a happy holiday to everybody. I hope you had a happy Hanukkah. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your, uh, uh, if you celebrate the 
uh, Las Posadas. Uh, still have a couple of nights of that uh, today, celebrating or observing the solstice. Festivus is uh, on uh, Wednesday, I believe, the 23rd, and Christmas, of course, on uh, the 25th, and Boxing Day on the 26th. And then New Year's Day. Looking forward to a fantastic 2021. So I wish everybody a safe and healthy, warm holiday, but most, most importantly, safe. Uh, I know everybody has the urge to gather with your family, but uh, in the best interests of you, yourself and your family, take proper precautions. Um, over 2,000 people are dying each day for the last three weeks in uh, the United States. Um, let's try and drop that number. Let's keep it low. So happy new year. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We will go to Lorianne Sales. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, everyone. Happy holidays. Um, I'll keep my remarks short and just want to uh, thank our frontline workers and everyone who's uh, working together to uh, ease the burden that the pandemic has caused. Um, share your sentiments for an even better 2021. Um, and just want to uh, thank all of our businesses and our residents who are uh, making the most of this time and uh, enjoying the holidays in a different way, maybe virtually or a little downsized, but um, wishing everyone uh, happy holidays and the best wishes for the new year. Thank you, Lorianne. We'll go to Neil Harris. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, everyone. Um, the clouds did part a little bit. I have a, a good view from the fourth floor of my house because the southern sky is clear. So I don't know if you can see that, but that was taken with my uh, camera camera, not with the phone. If you can see closely, there's two little dots above the brighter planet, which are the moons of Jupiter. Not as clear as some people that took pictures with telescopes, but with a good, any kind of decent backyard telescope, you can see Saturn's rings and Jupiter's bands pretty, pretty well. So hopefully we'll get some clearer skies tomorrow and it's a little bit better viewing. Anyway, looking forward to the fact that the days are getting longer and we're, uh, we're through the darkest days and into the light in many respects. Um, over the last couple of weeks, normally this time of year, for those of us in public office, we're very busy with holiday gatherings and things, but of course we didn't have any actual in-person gatherings. There were several events that were uh, notable. Um, the uh, Greater Washington Council of Governments had its annual meeting uh, and rewarded, uh, awarded the various uh, people that had performed duties for them. Uh, the uh, our board of supervisors of elections had a public forum to discuss what to do about the uh, elections going forward and that was an interesting discussion with much public input uh, the uh, uh, there was a, a meeting of a group that is formed to discuss ways to improve bus travel the montgomery better buses uh, program uh, is for formed and uh, I'll be very interested to see what they come up with, given the fact that there's virtually no budget to do anything interesting. But if you just remap the bus routes, we can probably make some great progress. Um, there was also the monthly meeting of the uh, Transportation Planning Board. And speaking of transportation, it was my pleasure to participate as the moderator of two panel discussions with the Leadership Montgomery Group with uh, one with the core group and the, another with the emerging leaders group uh, with several panel members to discuss various ways to improve transportation in the region. And we had a fun time. We gave each, uh, each team within the different groups $10 billion and a list of what everything costs to improve transportation and got a lot of really interesting approaches to uh, make transportation work better. So hopefully that will uh, stir people's thoughts and we'll figure out where to actually get the money to do some good work. Anyway, um, hope everybody has either had happy holidays or is about to have happy holidays and best wishes for a very happy and healthy new year and a much better 2021 for us all. Thank you.
Thank you, Neil. We will go to Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. I also want to wish everyone a happy winter solstice day today. And as we finally, finally approach the finish line of 2020, um, I'm reminded of the, the famous poem, The Shortest Day by Susan Cooper, which uh, happens to be about the solstice day and really beautifully captures the experience of countless generations of humanity making it through the long darkness uh, and the associated feelings of dread and uncertainty only to come out the other side through the sheer force of their will to survive and their optimism um, to end up celebrating a time of growing light and with it renewal and hope. And I can't think of a more apropos sentiment at this moment. I think we've all been sharing it um, in different words and different ways tonight and throughout the last several weeks. We are starting to see the light at the end of this very long tunnel with vaccines starting to roll out, um, but we still have a while longer to remain vigilant to uh, avoid letting our guard down and to do our part to help so many uh, still in need so that we can all enjoy a more prosperous and, and safer future together. I wanna urge those of us who are in a position to give, uh, to do so to those in need, please, 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 even if you have already given or volunteered this season, there is still so much need in our community and throughout the country and the world, and there will continue to be for the foreseeable future. So give to local charities uh, and support local businesses. Uh, you can do it while maintaining social distancing protocols. And to those who need help, please reach out to your friends and your neighbors and your networks and reach out to your city government here in Gaithersburg. We are here to support you. So um, a huge thanks to our city staff and all the essential workers for truly rising to meet the moments of 2020. And I wanna wish everyone, whatever traditions you observe or whatever faith you follow, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Solstice, Happy New Year, and a safe and joyful season full of appreciation for things we may have once taken for granted and full of hope for a better year ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Um, uh, picking up on what a couple of you have said, I, I just want to take a moment and, and thank some of the corporate uh, entities in the area, stakeholders who've uh, recently donated to our holiday giving program and to the CARES Hub and and otherwise. And you know, I I I don't I'm not privy to all of the donations we get because they don't. They, they don't usually come through us, but I, but, but actually, um, I did um, personally go uh, hear from Alexandria Real Estate. They they provide a very generous donation to our holiday giving program. Uh, Pete and Lee Henry did as well, and uh, Federal Realty um, also, uh, you know, just very generous stakeholders in the community. And there are others I just don't. They didn't. I wasn't associated with those, so. Um, so I don't. I'll leave it to staff to to thank them. But I wanted to I wanted to give them a shout out um, because as as other as council members have mentioned, um, you know, we couldn't have gotten help been such a great community and, and gotten through this without a lot of people uh, putting in their time and their energy and their money uh, and resources to people in need in our community. And we're proud of working with them, uh, what we've been able to get done and what we've been able to support other efforts for people, for organizations getting done for the community. And with that, I will, I will note that we do not have a work session next Monday, December 28th. The next regular meeting of the mayor and council will be on Monday, January 4th, 2021. Um, and it will be on Zoom, however you're watching us and we're participating. Um, you'll be able to do it just the same way on Monday, January 4th. And um, I will turn it over to, from the city manager to Tanisha. Thank you, Mayor. I have to tell you that I am very excited to be starting Team 21 with this amazing community and organization. So happy holidays to everyone, happy new year. I'll be very brief. Um, 
I had a chance to attend Winter Lights, and I know it's our 25th year, and, and many of you have been in this community for many years and have had the opportunity to attend Winter Lights, and it was, of course, my first time. And I, I don't know if you remember your first time, but it was completely magical, and I was so overwhelmed with the sheer effort that it has to take for our staff to pull that off and pull it together. And they did it effortlessly in the midst of a pandemic. And I just want to publicly state how much fun my husband and I and the two dogs had in the car. They actually did look at the lights for about two seconds and then they decided to nap for the rest of the tour. Um, but I just, I, you know, it's hard to turn the city manager off. So when I drive through things like that, when I experience our city in this way, um, I can't help but think about the work of our staff um, that goes into providing this just incredible experience. Watching all the kids hang out of the sunroofs, which drove my husband nuts, but I thought it was really cute and, and to see their faces and how excited they were. So congratulations to the staff for that. And, and continuing on the thing with the operations staff, um, I had my first winter weather event in the DMV last week. And that was, um, I thought the operations team did an incredible job, as I've heard they always do, um, clearing our streets and, and, and really showing where the, where the pie line is, if you will, for the city of Gaithersburg versus other communities and jurisdictions all around us. So shout out to the operations staff that, that just really uh, did a great job last week and, and of course an amazing job with the uh, Winter Lights Festival. I am going to um, leave it there. I have a fuller report for racial equity update later on uh, other under other staff reports. Dennis and I will report together. So, thank you. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, yeah, I, that's really, tech team, if you could bring up Tom Lonergan while I'm saying this, it's really nostalgic to think about the first time uh, going through Winter Lights and each year it sort of evolves a little, you know, there's some more fixtures that are, are, are added. They try some new things with, with uh, wrapping the trees and such. It's, it's just great. I'm so glad you had a chance to, to enjoy that. Um, so now we're going to move to from uh, or our economic development update with Tom Lonergan, who may have the best sweater of any of us. It's hard to see from the point of view. I understand that, but it is Dwight Schrute from the office that's on there. Um, but but thank you for thank you for the compliment, Mr. Mayor, and good evening. And and also while while I certainly don't want to throw uh, any sort of chill uh, to to cool all the uh, warmth that's been spread uh, over the last few minutes by all of you, I, I just wanted to have one quick mention that uh, between now and whenever. Uh, mass immunization um, begins, uh, there does lay several months of, of uh, pretty tough economic um, times for so many businesses in our city and beyond, um, and primarily small businesses that have really borne the financial brunt of, of this pandemic. Uh, previous uh, and current loan and granting programs have helped some of these businesses come cover some of their expenses and losses, but much more is clearly needed to help them through the next few months. Uh, but thankfully, as we enter 2021, it does look like uh, some new programs are rolling out. So very briefly for businesses here in Maryland, uh, on the 17th of this month, Governor Hogan did announce an additional $180 million in emergency state economic relief, including more help for hotels, entertainment venues, bars, and restaurants. The funding will be distributed through the counties, enhancing the earlier allocation to Montgomery County for aid to restaurants by an estimated $4.9 million dollars and adding about 6.2 million for the local hotel industry. Funds will need to be expended by the 31st of March, an extension beyond the previous deadline of the 31st of December. We will share the details of this program with the community uh, as more information becomes available and hopefully soon. And as for the federal programs, as you've probably heard, there's a new COVID stimulus uh, package and the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP will reopen. As you recall, the application process had closed in August. Changes include expanded eligibility for 501c6 nonprofits. Uh, previous beneficiaries of the program who experienced severe drops in revenue may be allowed to deduct the cost covered by forgiven loans on their federal tax returns and may also qualify for a second loan. 
businesses must apply via a lending institution for those funds. Uh, but as of earlier today, the SBA website had not yet published this news. Uh, we will be monitoring this program as well, and spread the information as it becomes available. But uh, in conclusion, as we wrap up our holiday uh, shopping, um, as, as Ryan alluded earlier, please remember that there are so many Gaithersburg businesses that are counting on your patronage between the pandemic and the crushing impact of online sales. Our brick and mortar retailers really need your support this season more than ever. Uh, it's really the best way for us to show our support for those uh, who have really helped to make the city city that it is. That's all I've got for tonight, Judd, and uh, I do want to wish each of you and all of yours a happy and healthy holiday. Right back at you, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Um, and next on our agenda is uh, from the city attorney. Lynn, do you have anything for us? Lynn, you are on mute. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to follow up very quickly on Neil's comments about the Board of Supervisors of Elections Forum and remind the public that uh, the board also has an election survey that is still open. It's accessible on the city's election page on the website and that survey will be open through December 31st. The board is really looking for input from our public uh, to guide their recommendation to the mayor and council on the conduct of the 2021 elections, so we would encourage all of our residents to access that survey and, uh, and take the survey. And again, happy holiday wishes to everyone. Thanks and to you too, Lynn. And next is from other staff and tech team, if you could bring up Dennis Enslinger, that would be great. And Tanisha and Dennis can give us the cohort update. Thanks, Mayor. I'll get started while we're bringing Dennis up. Um, so as you, as you all recall, the racial equity cohort um, presented recommendations as a result of their learning and training with AIR and the NW uh, program on your September 14th regular council meeting. Um, during that meeting, they made several recommendations to create an internal structure for citywide racial equity efforts um, to be led by a, a full-time employee to coordinate those efforts and also a core team made up of staff across all departments. Um, we were encouraged to conduct a deeper dive on data, workforce data, vendor data, and looking at our parks, recreation, cultural department program data, uh, as well as other data and limit the initiatives to a manageable yet meaningful few. And I believe they suggested a max of five so just a few updates uh, since September of what the cohort and other staff have been working on. Um, so they did, they were able, you may recall they reported they weren't able to complete the train the trainer series. Um, as you know, they started this project pre pandemic and had to convert to a virtual environment. Gare needed to convert the train the trainer sessions to a virtual setting, which hadn't been done. And so they were finally able to complete that process and um, Deputy City Manager Insinger also joined in with them on that. They did that at the end of October. The cohort has continued to meet internally to discuss citywide approaches to racial equity training, strategic plan initiatives, and future data collection efforts. They've also been gathering information on racial equity programs and efforts of small to mid-sized cities for um, picking up and following up on the discussion that was had at the September 14th meeting. Uh, some of the data continues, uh, and as you heard, some of their challenges to the data collection was not just that this was not their day jobs. All of the members of the cohort obviously uh, are working full-time for us, serving in other capacities, and have added this uh, project as they've gone through this training. That's not the only barrier. COVID has been a substantial barrier to us to be able to collect real baseline data because a lot of our, a lot of things are skewed this year, as you might imagine. So our applicant data has been gathered since March, but it's not sufficient at this time to report out on and will continue to collect. In fact, we just recently um, eased some of the hiring restrictions um, just late last week and earlier this morning. So we'll start to do a little bit more hiring. But the vast majority of our hiring, as you know, happens with 
um, parks recreation and culture, and that just wasn't um, on the table for 2020. And we're not exactly sure yet about 2021, so we'll continue to collect data there. Um, ActiveNet, which is our parks recreation and culture data system for programs, we've been collecting that data since June. And of course, that's not yet sufficient either to report out. Um, you heard from Elaine Richards at the uh, September 14th meeting. She's brand new with the city, started in June in our procurement um, division. Um, she has been working on a project with WC manager and Cinder, and he has some updates on the So I'll turn it over to Debbie's Thank you, Tanisha, and good evening, Mayor and City Council members and members of the public. Happy holidays, and same to the Mayor and Council. Um, in terms of the vendor tracking, we started out trying to look at what data we actually had uh, within the vendor categories, and we didn't have a lot of vendor information related to uh, minority or women-owned businesses. So procurement um, looked at completing a vendor information form and then sending that out um, to all the vendors that we currently have. We did accomplish that. Uh, we have used the federal designation in our classifications. Um, based on that, we did ask businesses to report if they were a, you know, a large business, a small business, a small disadvantaged business, a minority owned business, an A8 certified business, a women owned business, a hub business, veteran owned business, a disabled veteran owned business, native American owned business, Alaskan native owned business, or a nonprofit. Um, we have received uh, 79 responses from the vendors so far to date. Um, in a given year, we have somewhere between 100 and 120 unique vendors. Um, so we currently have a response rate of somewhere between 67 and 79%. Uh, we are working to update that information and get the rest of the vendors to submit that. We are also taking this opportunity to update the vendor contact information and the W-9s for all of our current vendors. Um, and this will allow us to kind of retire some of the non-active vendors that we currently have in our MUNIS or financial system. Of the data we received so far, 50% of the responses have indicated they are a small business. And again, that's based on the federal definition of under 500 employees. We have two which have self-identified themselves as disabled veteran-owned businesses. Um, we do have a, not a high percentage, but a, a good chunk, about 23% non-responsive in this category of information. So we send out the vendor response sheet that includes information on contact, new W-9s, and then we ask them to fill out this particular section. And uh, about so far, 19 of them have just not filled out that section. So about 23 are non-responsive in this category. Um, at this point, uh, with the data collected so far, uh, none of the businesses have identified themselves as minority owned or women owned or Native American or Alaskan Native owned. Um, we'll see if that number changes uh, once we get the remaining responses back from the vendors. Um, as we do that, we're also going to look at the data from FY20, uh, since that fiscal year is closed, and look at how the spending is related to the vendor list that we currently have for that year to see if there's any correlation to what they're purchasing and how we might improve uh, solicitation of vendors in those particular categories. We'll also look at the purchasing card data, which is a little bit different. Um, again, that's similar to a credit card. So we know the vendor, um, we, without doing a really deep dive, it's difficult for us to know exactly what was always purchased because that is hand calculated out. Um, we do have the receipts from each of those purchases and those are approved by department heads, um, but we don't have a database that contains all of those purchases um, down to exact items. We have done some other efforts, and Tanisha, I don't know if you want to start that, and then I can finish that up in addition to the vendor information. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. I'll just uh, briefly mention that um, the, I've been participating with the Kettering Foundation to help ICMA, which is um, our professional association, International City County Management Associations, 
Um, they're developing an institute on race equity and inclusion, and I've been participating through the Kettering Foundation with a small, uh, small group of city managers across the country to help inform that program. Uh, the National Civic League and the National League of Cities are also participating in that effort. And that has been a really great way to make additional contacts across the country uh, on others who are, who are engaging in this work. And then Dennis has a few points and I'll just wrap it up and take any questions if there are. As Tanisha indicated, you know, we're trying to look at the national level, but we're also trying to make sure we're actively involved at the regional level. Um, I've held a number of conversations with Tacoma Park regarding the possibility of how we might be able to work together and share some training resources. In addition, uh, Tanisha has had some discussions with uh, their city management team and their mayor about kind of the journey that Tacoma Park has gone on in terms of their racial equity. They're a little bit further along uh, than we are with our efforts. In addition, uh, throughout the last uh, year and a half, I've been working with the racial equity work group from the um, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Uh, this group was set up when the GARE cohort was started. Um, it was a work group initially, and it will actually be transferred into a standing committee within COG after the first of the year. Uh, that group will be called the Chief Equity Officers Committee. So it's gonna be more formalized and that's a really good resource. I've found that really helpful. Uh, the work group so far has developed a list of possible uh, racial equity trainers and uh, companies that could assist with data collection. Um, some of the other counties have existing contracts. And so we're trying to make sure that as a jurisdiction, we might be able to ride those contracts should we want to use those services. In addition, uh, the Washington or Council of Governments has also issued an RFP for training and data collection. Uh, their staff is currently reviewing that RFP and the work group's going to review all that information um, in January. In addition, one of the recommendations that's come out of the work group that will eventually become the Chief Equity Officers Committee is to identify some regional approach to training of elected officials um, at your level. Um, some of the discussions have been that we would offer a series of trainings over the next year um, that could be taken at different times. Um, you know, your guys' schedules are often full. So we we're trying to set up a course of trainings that might be able to take in at various times. We'll have a little bit more discussion at our January meeting. Uh, that committee will meet on a monthly basis, this is similar to other COG committees. And so going forward, um, the cohort obviously is going to continue uh, to leverage its learning and training that, it's, that they've received over the last year. So, um, so they're gonna continue to meet as an internal core group and Dennis and I are actually um, partnering meeting with them so that they do have leadership presence uh, with their group and, and we're looking forward to moving on to the next step, which um, I'm looking forward to our February retreat where I want to talk a little bit more in depth about our plans for 2021. Um, and so I'm gonna be calling that our um, year of awareness and action because we, we need a little bit of both uh, to try to, to advance the ball here for the city of Papersburg. And so we'll talk more about that at our February retreat. And then Dennis and I are, are happy to continue to provide uh, verbal updates like this one at our regular um, meetings. So we'll report out on the second meeting of the month uh, any, any new activities uh, that we've been able to participate in or complete or new information we've been able to identify. So we want, you know, want to make sure that you all know that uh, this work is still continuing. We may not talk about it all the time at our public meetings, but there's certainly a lot of work happening behind the scenes. And I think, you know, our challenge would be making sure that we don't duplicate efforts and we're able to fold in um, efforts that are happening around us, near us, uh, through some of our professional associations and organizations that we have access to so that we can leverage all the resources we can uh, to really make some significant progress here. So thank you for that time. I think we're all, we're all done. Anybody have any questions or comments? 
Lorianne, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Tanisha and Dennis, for the update. Um, I know that we will get additional updates as uh, the discussions continue. I did have some questions for clarity about the original data that's been collected. Um, I believe you mentioned that about 70 responses have been received from the businesses that we currently contract with over the past year or just since the beginning of 2020. We actually sent it to all the vendors that we had in our list, um, but we got 79 back. And typically we have, you know, 100 to 120 unique vendors. Our current vendor list within Munis is quite large because we have not um, basically pared that down as vendors leave. In particular, you know, we have a number of contracts that are awarded for a one-time or a one-year event, especially a lot of the CIP projects or construction projects are that way. Um, so they're still on the vendor list, but they probably haven't been active for the last three years. So we're trying to pare down who's actually active. Um, we don't get very good response for somebody who isn't a vendor currently, because um, from their perspective, you know, I think they see it as additional workload. So of the 79 that we got back, I believe they're all active vendors currently um, either last year or the current fiscal year. Okay, and out of all of the responses received, none of our contracting businesses are meet the diversity requirement. Again, I, I, I can't always definitively say that because it's self-reporting. Um, so no one's identified themselves as a minority owned business at this point. And again, you know, part of the problem is of the 79, you know, approximately 23%, 18 just ignored that whole section or didn't check any of the boxes at all. And they would normally fit one of the boxes, at least a large or small business. Um, so we're not sure um, what category they would be in. So we may have to do some follow-up uh, with those individuals. Okay. And then I had a, another question about the um, the difference between the uh, one-offs, the one-time contractors and any repeat contractors. If um, I guess once additional data is collected, I don't know what the period is for uh, additional data for this, but are we tracking this data that we're collecting in the newly created application? We're tracking all of these data points. Again, currently it's mostly by hand. It's an Excel spreadsheet. We are trying to work with Munis to put in this data into our vendor data format, um, but that has not been accomplished yet. The goal for that would be starting in January. Uh, we'd be able to enter all this data into the Munis system. Um, I'll have to check with IT to see if we're going to meet that goal. It's a little bit difficult with Munis because we're relying on them to do a lot of the programming. Um, for that to happen. Yeah, and I would just add that going backwards and collecting data from someone who, you know, may not be trying to get business from the city is a little more challenging than going forward. So as Mullane instituted this data collection project, we were going, we were looking backwards, but we were also starting to collect this on new vendors. I think the compliance rate with new vendors will be much higher because the motivation is a bit different at that point in the process. So will you be making recommendations at the end of 2021 about how to diversify our procurement or how to... Um... I, I mean, I think we can, we can talk about diversifying procurement even outside of knowing what our baseline is, but I'm not sure that we, that we we can rely on the information we have now to say that that's our baseline. Given that that number of businesses just completely skip the section, you know, it's, it's difficult to know if that's our real baseline or not. Um, to put it into context, 120 active unique vendors potentially out of, I think there's like 3,700 vendors, you know, total in the database, the vast majority of which are, are inactive. So, I think 2020 was a, a challenging period in general to collect data. And, and we understand, you know, 
where we need to improve the data collection piece so that we have better baseline information to measure our progress, but it doesn't prevent us from instituting better practices or best practices to diversify our procurement. Okay. Thank you. And some of those items might be holding fairs um, with minority-owned businesses to see where they fit in or other categories such as that and then to track that to see if it's making a difference on who applies. I think it's also important that we put procurement in to an overall context of how much procurement we actually do um, that's by solicitation. Um, you know, excluding the CIP projects, which tend to be one-off solicitations, you know, they're not ongoing solicitations. In addition, we have a number of expenses that are with you know, vendors that we don't do procurement on a regular basis. So that might be healthcare, that might be retirement benefits and who's managing our retirement funds, things like that, which are pretty large expenditures relative to the overall city budget. So I wanna make sure that we provide you a context of, you know, where is the best emphasis for us to put our efforts to increasing minority and women owned businesses and some of the other categories with regard to the procurement that we can actually have a, a, a significant impact. Yeah, that's a great point. I think Neil brought up that point during the September meeting that what, what's the universe of dollars that we're talking about? Well, we don't have a good answer for you right now, but that's the answer that we need to make sure you know, as we set goals and put new practices in place that, that we have that number because that'll be important to know if we're making progress or not. Cities generally, general rule of thumb is 80-20, right? and the majority of our funds go toward people, um, their salary, their benefits, things like that, and 20% sort of other things. Um, and so vast scheme of a city budget, it's a small, it's a much smaller number, but it's still a substantial number that you know if we could diversify that with. And uh, I just want to make one final point. Um, I appreciate you, Dennis, for mentioning the uh, a resource fair. Um, I think with all of the programs that we have through our toolbox program um, and our CDBG program, um, it would be helpful for um, our businesses and potential partners to know um, about all the great things that we offer and maybe not just uh, on our website, but finding more opportunities to engage with the business community and potential partners is going to be helpful. Thank you. We'll go to Mike. Mike, you are muted. I lost my mouse. <clears throat> uh, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Lorianne's last point about uh, our resource fairs is pretty important, but I think also if we want, we have to be intentional about this. So I think we have our outreach has to be pretty intentional. I thought I would expect the state uh, at some level to have a list, a compiled list of minority owned, veteran owned, women owned uh, businesses in the state, but I don't know that for sure. But if certainly we could work from a list like that for uh, to uh, as part of an outreach effort to make sure that we uh, made those companies or those vendors uh, aware of uh, potential opportunities to do business with the city. So um, uh, I think that's that's always um, a, a good thing to do, uh, and and we should certainly we should certainly look forward to doing things like that in the future, especially as we, off, if we're gonna offer a resource fair, or participate in those, then we should make sure that the, the, that the organizer of those, whether we're partnering with somebody else or doing it on our own, are uh, reaching out to those uh, various entities that are minority owned, women owned, veteran owned, disabled owned, et cetera, uh, just as a starting point. Um, we, you know, we can only do uh, business with people that actually that we either solicit or are aware that they have opportunities to do business with the city. So it's important that, that uh, I think we're, that's part of our active outreach effort. I think I really appreciate the report, uh, Tanisha and Dennis, uh, and the update. Uh, certainly, I think 
we're at a point where before we start making a lot of decisions, we need to have some data to be able to base those decisions on. So um, uh, I'm looking forward to the, the regular updates on that. And, um, and then to discussing this perhaps at the at our February uh, retreat as part of our, our vision going forward, uh, the strategic vision for the city going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, anybody else? All right. Well, uh, progress. Thank you very much, Denise and Dennis. And I will remind uh, everyone else, uh, I'll remind everyone that we do not have a meeting next Monday. Um, we wish everyone Merry Christmas, Happy Solstice, Happy Kwanzaa, all the holidays that are coming between now and, and New Year's. Um, we hope it's wonderful. We're looking forward to an amazing prosperous, happy, healthy 2021. Hopefully, I just knocked on wood here. And um, I, I want to thank staff for for um, for all the presentations tonight and uh, including the including this uh, last one. And I want to uh, reiterate that Winter Lights is open. Uh, and it's it's wonderful Buy your tickets in advance. Uh, you're better off going during on weeknights than on weekends because it's so popular this, this year. Uh, but we hope you'll enjoy it just as Tanisha did and, and, and we all have done. It's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful time. Crank up the holiday tunes, uh, bring the dogs in the car. Uh, that's a new one for me, but I like that idea. And um, so we will see everybody next time on January 4th, next regular meeting of the Mayor and Council. Until then, let's do great things in Gatesburg. Happy everything. Good night. Happy New Year.